What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks, presented by Zaxby's DJ Bucky. Back with you, Buck. How you doing, man? Man, I'm good. I am good, DJ. Like it's it's funny. Like we're in that that I won't say that weird time, but an interesting time because for us, we're in the uh, run to the playoffs, so we're paying attention to the NFL teams. But it's really time to ramp up our college study and look at these guys. And so because um, guys have been going, and even though some of these abbreviated seasons have been uh, cut short and are, are coming to a close, like we're trying to catch up on the players and the prospects and kind of know who's in and who's out and what to think about all of it. Yeah, it's a it's it's a weird it's a weird year, man, all the way around. But yeah, with the draft prep, it is a little bit tricky right now. You know, I, I get names the way I kind of go I'll take you behind the scene here of kind of how I go about my process is I, I'll talk to teams around the league. The first thing I've got to do is I got to produce a top 50 list, which is the junior declared. First, day, one, which is is tough. Yeah, the first the, one is tough. It's tough. Yeah. Right. So that's usually like 15th, 16th January, somewhere around there every year. So and I eventually like if you look ahead to the calendar, once we get to the combine, I have to have done every player. I, I like to have done every single player that's at the combine. I'm fortunate enough to do that the last couple of years. So that's that's 350 yeah. players or whatever it is. So that's kind of where I need to get. I have these markers. I need to get to there by the combine. So when I have the top 50 list, I usually try and get to watch about 100 to 120 guys to produce my initial top 50 list. And the, the way I come about those names is I'll call around the buddies around the league and I'll go by position. Okay, let's go over the uh, quarterbacks you think are top 50 caliber players. And mm -hmm. you can get like six guys. Okay, let's go over the running backs you think are top 50 caliber players. Go through every position like that. And usually when you talk to enough people, you'll end up with 100 to 120 names that they think are potential top 50 picks. So that's how I sit down and watch him. So I, I, I'm working through – I've done the offensive linemen that I've – you know I feel good about that, so I've got those guys done. So now I'm working on corners. So that's a position I'm going through. So I call these teams. So I've got my list. I put all the names in my notebook, list them all out, and so then I'm just going to go one by one. And then I like I start off a couple Central Florida corners. Central Florida's got two corners that could be top 50 picks. So – I, I pop on Central Florida. The first I see the one guy, he's lined up in the nickel. He's got dreads. Okay, I know who he is, so I can keep an eye on him. And I'm, you know, play two, play three. I can't find the other guy. Where the heck's the other guy? Can't find him. I'm like, okay, may, maybe he missed this game. Let me click on another game real quick. Click on another game. See my guy with my dreads in the slot. He's still there. Don't know where. Can't find the other guy. So I'm like, Google injury. Because normally when we're doing mm -hmm. this, right, you don't see a guy. You type in his name, injury. Nothing. No injuries. What the heck? Where is this guy? He opted out. So he didn't play this year. So I'm going to I'm going to instead of being efficient and watching the three yeah. Central Florida games and knocking those two corners out, I'm going to watch three games this year for one corner and I got to go back and watch three games last year for the other corner. Like it's going to make the process just so just just janky uh for lack of a better word. So so it's interesting because I've had this conversation um uh with people in the league and outside the league about how are you going to treat the opt out guys? in terms of the grade and the evaluation, um, especially when you have maybe two guys that one played, one didn't. Um, how, how, are you, how are you going to do it, especially if they're similarly talented? Oh, the advantage is going to go with the guy you just saw, if it's close. Yeah. Like I mean, I, you haven't seen the guy playing here. You're not, you're not going to rate him over somebody it's, if it's close. If it's yeah, close. It's really, it's really hard for me. Um, so, for instance, the guy who joined the, the show, like Caleb Farley. So, we've seen him play a year ago. Um, and, and how do you assess that as you're projecting that out versus a Sean Wade who decided to come back and play? And I'm not saying that there's simply great. Caleb Farley's the winner in that contest. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and spoil saying, that one. I know, but, but I'm just saying like, yeah, yeah. If, if they were similarly graded or whatever, like that's the thing. But I, I do believe like this year is going to be one of the more interesting years when it comes to the draft, because there is a lot of uncertainty in terms of games played, where people are in their development the guys that you saw versus the guys that you haven't seen. Um, how much are you willing to bank on upside and projection versus, hey, I've seen him this year. I know exactly what he is. And even though you see him this year, how much was he impacted by the things, the stop, start, practice schedules, the whatever issues they may have suffered from internally? It's just a lot, man. It's just so much uncertainty this year more than – than other years, I wonder from a decision maker standpoint, we always talk about, hey, you can win a lot of games hitting doubles. If this is the year that you're like, yeah, I'm going to be a little more conservative when it comes to my picks to just make sure I get good guys that are just coming in, they're going to contribute. And I may not worry about finding the superstar 
um, unless I'm in the top five. Well, here, here's the other thing. So one of the uh, cool advantages about being out here in Southern California is that between r- around where you live and down in Orange County and in San training Diego, yeah, all facility. these training facilities, right? So it's just a huge influx of players. And some of these guys that opt out have already been at some of these facilities. But because of the pandemic and California being way more restrictive – and talking around to folks, it sounds like these guys aren't coming to California this year. They're going to go to Pensacola. They're going to be in, in Dallas. They're going to be other places just because of the limitations that they have out here, um, which means hopefully uh, – and hopefully I can figure out a way to make this work. But, like, I'm, I need to go to Pensacola. Mm-hmm. I need to go to Dallas and spend a couple of days there because I, I don't I want to show up at the Combine not having put eyeballs on some of these kids in over a year. And not get a chance to see them. You know, hopefully we have the Senior Bowl. Hopefully that, that looks like that's going to happen. Um, so that'll be a good opportunity to see those kids. But, man, there's a whole a bunch of other guys that you would normally see at the East-West game or you would see in live games that we just haven't got a chance to see this year. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's – Want to go to Pensacola, weird. Buck? What do you think? Make I mean, a trip, road trip? Yeah, Pensacola and Dallas. Uh, Arizona would probably kick up a little bit. I would think that at some of the places – there that yeah that's a good one you have have exos there i think in arizona right so you may be able to see because yeah but dj this this is going to be i would say even a bigger challenge than last year when it comes to drafting i think scouts this year will be challenged in a way that they never have because the whole virtual scouting deal not being able to do school calls not being able to really kind of be around them and yeah we can have these zoom calls with liaisons and administrators and coaches and those things but there's nothing like being there face to face to not only have those in-person conversations, but to be able to observe and watch and to talk to others around the program. Uh, you're missing that. And so when you're trying to put together that profile, uh, the profile is going to be incomplete in a bunch of different areas. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting year, man. Uh, maybe something we can talk to our buddy, uh, Coach Brian Billick, who's going to join the show here in just a little bit. He is the uh, Super Bowl winning head coach. I had a chance to work with him with the Baltimore Ravens. Um, he's uh, been at the NFL Network for quite some time, and it's actually going to be uh, part of a brand new podcast that's launching on NFL Media, which is the Total Access podcast with uh, with our other buddy, Mike Michael Robinson. So it's going to be those two guys uh, joining forces there for the new NFL Total Access podcast. So we're going to talk to Coach Billick here in just a minute. Uh, but before we do get to Coach Billick, I, I know, Buck, we, we were talking about this off air. I want to touch on this a little bit. Um, th- with it being a weird year, um, we've seen – we've heard uh, John Schneider talk about the fact that factored into his trade of draft picks for Jamal Adams, who has, has had a really good year for them when he's been on the field and really their best pass rusher. He's been mm-hmm. outstanding. Uh, in that role. But you've got that trade. You've got the Hopkins trade, the Diggs trade. We've seen a lot of these uh, veteran moves that those players that have moved on have uh, have really played well and made a big difference for their team. And then why don't you hit on that side of it, then I'll hit on some of the other side, what the other teams were thinking with those moves. Yeah, DJ, I think it's really interesting. Um, and we've talked about it. We've talked about it in the context of where your quarterback is and where your team is. Is your team on the cusp of being able to be a legitimate contender? And only – the decision making can really assess that by saying, man, where is the hole? Where is the one piece that we need, not necessarily to get over the top, but the one thing that we know we need to shore up to get there. And so when you think about Stefan Diggs, and I think the Stefan Diggs trade is going to go down as a win win because I think for Buffalo, it has absolutely helped um, accelerate the development of Josh Allen. Uh, he has a legitimate number one receiver, and Stefan Diggs has been good. So the number one pick that you surrendered as the Buffalo Bills. You feel good about that because Stefan Diggs has given you exactly what you wanted, a high-end player that can come in and ball out. DeAndre Hopkins, which was a steal because you only had to give up a two to get, he has been a solid player. He has helped Kyler Murray. That offense has kind of run through him, and he's been good. Jamal Adams gave the Seattle Seahawks what they needed defensively because they didn't have a pass rusher when they mm-hmm. weren't able to secure Jadavian Clowney, who hasn't played well for the Tennessee Titans. He hasn't given them any of that He's done now. Yeah, that zero they, sacks. Thought, done. You know, like – I mean, they get Jamal Adams, and Jamal Adams has come in, has given them seven and a half sacks. He's been their best pass rusher, and even though he has some deficiencies and limitations in coverage, for what they're asking him to do as a box area defender, he's been perfect. Um, I even think about, like, Leonard Williams and what Leonard Williams has done in the two years. He's been great. He's been great for them. And so recently we've seen that the teams that have um, gone for the proven commodity as opposed to waiting to see what's behind door number one or door number two, they've been successful. And I do wonder, as we think about this draft and going forward, will more general managers think about, hey, give me what I've seen have success at this level 
as opposed to what could be um, what I could acquire in, on the draft. Yeah, it's interesting when we look at the other side of it, right? So for you know Minnesota, I really think that is a win-win. Mm -hmm. You know, for both teams, they get exactly what they wanted. Uh, when you look at the numbers here, Stephon Diggs has caught 90 balls, right? That's a that's a big total. He's caught 90 balls to Justin Jefferson 61. So you've had a lot more opportunities to make you know plays underneath, and, and Stephon Diggs done a really nice job of that. Justin Jefferson has two more receiving yards, 1,039 to 1,037. He's got three more touchdowns, seven to four, and average per catch, obviously much bigger, 17 to 11.5. So Justin Jefferson's having a historical year. He's 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 on pace. I saw this thing. He's on pace to have the most uh, uh, receiving yards in the in the modern era. Like going to surpass Randy Moss from his rookie mm -hmm. year, um, and Anquan Bolden. I think those are the top two. Like over 1,300 yards. Um, if he holds pace here. So he's been awesome and outstanding. But I understand it from the Buffalo side, which was still as much as we love Justin Jefferson, there's always a little unknown when you're drafting somebody. Stephon Diggs is a known known commodity. Mm -hmm. You know exactly what you're getting. And he's been exactly who they thought he was going to be. Um, and he's been a nice outlet and a nice uh, security blanket there for Josh Allen. And you can't argue with the with the results, not only from what he's done, but from Josh Allen and his comfort level and where he's taken his game to a whole new level. So I think that's a great example of it working out for both teams. Uh, the Jamal Adams thing, we've talked about this before. The Jets weren't there, obviously, is they don't have a win. They aren't on the cusp. They have a, a, a little bit of a rebuilding process ahead of them. So being able to secure more picks and more assets – and as well as cap space, being able to use some of that money to sprinkle around, they can um, spend that money on some other positions, the key positions where they don't have any good players. Um, so that one, I think, has got another chance to work out for both teams. The one that I can't make any sense out of is DeAndre Hopkins. Like they, If you're going to trade him, like it's kind of like the Diggs thing, right? Well, man, that's a really good player. If you're going to trade him, you better be sure you're getting some equal value back. And I can't look at that Hopkins trade and say, I understand what you're saying in terms of paying Deshaun Watson and some of the money stuff, and it just doesn't really fit. Um, we want to sprinkle those resources around. I get a little bit of that, but you still got to get fair value if you're going to trade him. They didn't get anywhere near fair value. No, and I, I, I just think that's, that's just being unable to recognize what you have and, and not understanding the market value for the player that you have and, and what you can get. And he got fleeced. Um, yeah. And the Texans uh, haven't, so I mean, they haven't been able to make that up. And, you know, when you come to Deshaun Watson, and Deshaun Watson has been able to play great in spite of that. But, yeah, like that's a huge loss. Um, I might contend that it actually has enabled Deshaun Watson to play better because you kind of took the training wheels off and you made him play like full quarterback and utilize all of the weapons or uh, the people that he had around him. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know how you – can say that. And I think for the Cardinals, I mean, it's been good. He's a number one because Larry Fitzgerald was older. Uh, Christian Kirk was not necessarily built to be a number one receiver. So it fit a nice need. Uh, they were able to resign him and get him and, and do all this stuff. So he'll be their number one receiver going forward. But on the other end, I, I just don't know. I, I, I think a lot of it is when you're the decision maker is being able to understand what's on the horizon in the draft class. What, what is available? Yeah. What, okay. What's available versus where we need. If there's a, a huge sur surplus or there enough where we feel like we can fit the bill and we're like, okay, let's trade off an asset, whatever. Years ago, back in the day, um, Ron, w Ron Wolf would always talk about um, the premise behind taking the best available player is that if you take the best available player, even at a position where you're pretty loaded at, it gives you a surplus. And if you have a surplus, then you can auction it off to get eventually what you need. And so, um, there is something to be said for that. There's something to be said for acquiring enough talent that you can trade off some of these guys and get assets in return to help you fill out your team. But you just have to be really, really good at picking players and assessing market value and also assessing what the next draft classes will also bring in return. Yeah, well, it's – it really interesting a year to have this many trades like that, and we'll see what happens as we go into this next offseason, how it shapes up. But it, I think those two things, those two topics we just hit there, the uncertainty, trying to figure out this draft class with the opt-outs and some guys playing more games than others, and you know, just the whole thing, you know, maybe the elimination of some of these all-star games, it's going to it's gonna make it more difficult. So that makes sense why you would be more willing to part with some of those picks, but also opportunity because if you look at it from that standpoint – if you're if you're the team that gets buttoned up and handles and gets your information and 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 really you know has has a good feel for this draft, I think you're going to see this draft more than any other 
where you're going to be picking in the third round and it's going to be, you know, whatever, pick 72. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be like, dude, our 20th, 20th player is available. You know what I mean? Because they're going to be stacked so differently across the league. Yeah, I think that, that is really, really um, important. It's, it's going to be something to watch as we go forward. Um, every draft board is always different. But this year, the, the variances between draft boards will, will – Oh, it's going to be crazy. Will, it's it's going to be significant. I'm, I'm, I'm already convinced. That, look, I – Every year, my goal is always to try and have something on every player that gets picked, you know, and inevitably it's five yeah. to eight guys that get picked that you just, you don't have. You, you watch, I think I end up normally with like 400 guys. So 400 guys, there's 250 you know, picks or whatever there mm -hmm. are. And still, there's going to be five to eight guys that get picked that just, you don't, you don't know who they are. And I have any guess this year, yeah. dude, Buck. There's going to be like 40, 50 guys that get picked that I'm not going to have anything on because it's, yeah, it's good luck. flying and blind. And it's a, it's a very, very challenging process as it is, um, you know, and, and trying to, to empower just so uh, like a little behind baseball. Um, most teams that I've been around and familiar with, like the draft board typically has anywhere from 100 to 150 yeah, names. We're, on we were board. at 150 everywhere I was, yeah. 150. Um, some, some other teams have um, – 200 or so, but like, so normally you just know those, but to think about all the variances this year, they're going to be guys that get drafted that ownership and people are going to ask you, are you like, I mean, yeah, <laughs> we don't know. I mean, what do you want to do? So, all right. I think we've got coach here. Let's, let's, uh, let's bring in coach Billick's going to join us. All right, coach. First of all, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I, I'm just curious. What, what, what does Brian Billick have going on uh, during the day today? What'd you do before you joined us today? <laughs> well, you to? today, you know, today's my podcast day. Uh, and so I'm kind of jumping around through here. I've got to tell you, and I told Bucky before I, I we just finished, I was coaching my grandson's third grade football team. Oh, you're I was, coaching, nice. you're coaching I was the there. defensive coordinator and it's a little bit different. It's okay. <laughs> do you have your helmet? <laughs> are your shoes tied right. are you supposed to be in now or should you be on the side i mean it's so it's uh i told someone they said well how is it comparing to, to, to coaching uh pro players i said well one group is young immature and and irresponsible and the third graders aren't easy to work with either so <laughs> Coach, I think I'm a firm believer that it's not it's not much different. I think no, there's no really there's, coaching is coaching. It is. Yeah, I, I think I think teaching and coaching is great. And and thinking about that, coach, we're we're at the time of year where um inevitably there are gonna be some coaching changes. And on the outside, there are a lot of conversation about which guys are the most qualified. This guy would be a great head coach, and those things. Having sat in that chair and been responsible for building a team, a Super Bowl winner. What are the essential qualities and characteristics that we should be looking for from a head coaching candidate? You know, it's and it's funny because during the hiring process, you become focused on the flavor of the month, usually an offensive or defensive coordinator. We have expanded a little bit with Joe Judge and the special teams coaches, which I think is great. I, I, I think that's an untapped resource because you have someone that, one, works with the entire team, to really ask to work with players who really don't want to be doing that. You know, no one goes in the backyard as a kid and pretends that they're covering kickoffs, right? They're catching touchdowns and throwing the ball and whatever. And they have to look at athletes in a framework of, okay, maybe he's not a starter. Maybe he's not a 65 snap guy, but he's a 15 snap guy or a 20 snap guy that can give me quality special team snap. So that's a good perspective to have. And I think the mistakes that are made is when the powers that be look at, at, okay, the round up the usual suspect, they become too focused on, okay, this is an offensive guy, this is a defensive guy, uh, mm -hmm. rather than the little bit harder of stepping back and, and deciding, okay, first off, what are the qualities that we're looking for in a head coach? You know, typically it's okay. They're just going to round up the usual suspects, and and, and okay. Well, I like what this guy said. Rather than go, well, wait a minute. And and I think Baltimore has done a good job with that over the years. I think Ozzie Newsom and and uh, uh, could enlighten you in terms of the process they went through, whether it was my hiring or John Harbaugh's, um, where it was. Well, okay, wait a minute. Let's let's identify what it is we're specifically looking for. What qualities? And it's mm -hmm. different from one team to another. 
you know, because it's where are you at and what do you need at that time? What kind of transition are you making? And, and okay, now let's, let's I see if we can identify guys that have those attributes rather than, okay, let's just bring in a bunch of guys that are on the top of the list. And we kind of like what this guy said the most. So we're going to hire him. Coach, I, I, I'm glad that you, you talked about the qualities there because I, I wrote down the ones that, that I would want in a head coach. And I want to get your feedback on that and see maybe there's some holes in what we're missing here. Um, I talked about uh, start with leadership and, and that in, envelops being an excellent communicator, cast the vision, create the culture and be able to cultivate relationships individually, you know, downstairs, upstairs, across the whole building. A teacher, which I think is is, is underutilized, just prioritizing the details. And that's in your preparation and then also in your development. Uh, with everybody individually. And then the last one I thought I wrote down, I, I think is the most important, which is authentic. Um, you're honest, reliable, dependable. You kind of know who you are. You're comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. You, in terms of the mistakes that are made, I mean, you've seen it. You've been around forever, coach. Like those, Mike Tomlin's very comfortable in who he is. Andy Reid and Mike Tomlin, I mean, polar opposite personalities, but they're very right. authentic. You know exactly who they are. Trying to hire somebody that's the junior version of somebody else and, and bill belichick could be a great example like don't that's don't try classic. and be don't try and be bill just be you it's the classic that's why the the train of or the 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 litany of bill belichick disciples joe gibbs was the same way those guys for whatever reason did not do well because they they tried to be mini joe gibbs they tried to be mini bill belichick's which you're exactly right if you're trying to be somebody else you cannot sustain it it all sounds good up front. I, I've often said, hence leaving coaching, particularly in my corporate speaking, when people have always said, well, why don't you go back into coaching? And my answer has always been, well, they want young and cheap and I'm neither. So I'm, uh, I'm done with it. <laughs> but, but I said, if I, and I learned a lot, I've got to tell you, I learned a lot when I left and, and was doing game for Fox because what did I do? Every Friday I'm sitting in another building talking to players, coaches, general managers, owners. I'm watching, in many instances, invited into meetings and watching how they practice and how they do this. Um, have sat in virtually every, you know, imagine getting to sit in your competitor's boardroom. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, if I did come back to coaching and I would be better at it because of that experience, here's exactly what I do. One, and you begin with a certain fundamental knowledge of the game. Those that are interviewing uh, from the football standpoint, quite frankly, and I always tell guys that I mentor in terms of interviewing, I always tell them, remember, you're the expert. Because mm. quite frankly, the guys that are asking you the question don't even know the right question to ask. Okay? Mm. In most instances, they've never really done it. So when it comes to the football part of it, you're the expert. But now with, with regards to the other thing, I would first bring together, obviously, the best staff I could. And, and we were pretty good at that in terms of the best quality of people, the diversity that you want. You don't want all the same guy. You, you know, every, players have to be able to go and, and sound off at different people. Everybody brings something a little different to the table. So you put the best staff can together. You create a unified vision for where you're going. And it's amazing how often that doesn't happen. Offense, defense, special teams, the organizational whole – what, where is it we think we are? Where are we going? What kind of athletes do we need to get there? And do we have the same? Are we? Have, you can scrounge it around. We can disagree. But at the end of the day, do we have this shared vision in terms of what we're looking for? Play like a raven was the term, right, uh, DJ, that we talked yeah. about. And then as the head coach, my job would be to spend every waking minute, player by player, every person in the organization, pushing them towards the leadership of the coaches. Mm -hmm. to make sure that they were following that vision that we had set. And it, you're right, DJ, it is a day-to-day. -day, it's not a one lecture, one size fit. I mean, it's a day-to-day -day touching every player, mm -hmm. to a lesser degree, but still everybody in the organization as well, to make sure that we're all, you know, uh, reading from the same hymnal. Real, real quick, Buck, I want to just finish mm -hmm. that point there, Coach. We had Dave Roberts on, just won the World Series with the Dodgers, and he talked about – um, that we talk about it all the time, but he said he would try and really schedule time every day with different players individually to have that one-on-one -on -one where they are, where they need to go, what they need to do to get there. And, and we've kind of said, if you're going to get somebody that's got the best scheme in the world, that's going to hide in his corner office and draw plays up all day long. Like you got the wrong guy. Right. That, and it doesn't exist. That, that, that yeah. guy does not exist. And so that interaction, and as you know, DJ, that's one of the reasons I, I ran the scout teams. Mm -hmm. The reason I did that 
is it forced me to touch everybody on the team on, you know, the starters you'd normally have in your action, but that next level guy, because I was running the scout team, the prep team on both sides. And Denny Green taught me that. And it was a way for me to touch the players and interact with these guys every day. Coach, that's, that's great. You talked about uh, running the scout teams. I will say this, uh, during my time in Green Bay, Andy Reid was the tight end coach and he ran the scout team mm-hmm. and scout team defense and on the cars and those things. Gained a lot of respect for him and his ability to relate and those things. I think one of the things um, that may be underrated when it comes to being a head coach is adaptability and being able to change. You obviously came from Minnesota where you guys played a certain way offensively and Baltimore at some point you had to change a little bit based on the strengths of the team. Um, how stubborn should the head coach be when it comes to how he's used to playing versus a, hey, this is, this team is built a certain way. I have to coach and get them to play a different way because that's the best way for them to win. Oh, absolutely. When I talked about creating that shared vision and the athletes that we need to execute that vision. That's all well and very, you know, well and very good. But at the end of the day, when you get an athlete, it's okay. You better adapt it to what does he do best. I remember when uh, Bill Walsh, who was obviously a, a mentor of mine and, and consulted on a regular basis, and, and I was in Minnesota. And Denny Green, you know, Denny was my, my the, the, the biggest mentor I had, but he had come from Bill Walsh. So, you know, uh, uh, there was residual effect there in terms of, of my mentor being mentored by these two great coaches. And I remember when I had uh, Randall Cunningham in Minnesota and, and, and I would talk with Bill and go, okay, so what should I be doing? He says, you need another quarterback. Uh, and he says, you need, you know, because for what you need to do to so-and-so you need, I said, Oh, okay. But, but that's who I've got bill. So yeah. what do I, and, and he was, no, you need another quarterback. You know, he, he wouldn't, you know, and not that Bill wouldn't wouldn't be flexible, but Bill, obviously, his quarterbacks, he had a very specific skill set mm-hmm. that he wanted from his quarterback position, which is all well and good. And he found it in a number of different ways. But you're absolutely right. You, 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 you better adapt. And for me, it was when I got to Baltimore, I'm this supposed offensive guru, which is all BS as we know, but but <laughs> and so but I came in as an offensive guy, and so you think this is what it takes. To win a championship, we got to have a certain level. And I just come from the highest scoring offense in the history of the league in ball in, in Minnesota. Well, I get there and there's this record setting defense, not only record setting defense, maybe the best single season defense in the history of the game. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't until about midway through that first year that it dawned on me okay, no, we, if we don't, if we run the ball and don't turn the ball over, we can win a championship. And that's a, that was a major shift to be able to say, yes, we can win a championship that way. Um, and, and this defense is good enough to do that with. So we had to, I had to change my mindset in, in play calling and what we were doing to understand, no, we can play to that strength um, and win a championship. Because otherwise, you can, you can do the other thing and work up a lot of numbers. But if you come short of, you know, if you don't win the Super Bowl, then it's all for naught in today's NFL. So that you're right. For a lot of guys, that that is a major sea change. Um, to 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 say, okay, this is what I've always believed we needed to win, but I've got a group of athletes that are unique, and we can probably, you know, Tony Dungy, I think, will tell you that on the flip side. You know, the football gods are 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 funny guys now. I mean, <laughs> here they give me an offensive guy, the greatest single defense in it, and they give Tony Dungy, you know, maybe <laughs> one of the greatest quarterback. <laughs> And Tony had to change your mind because he'd be in a defensive guy and thought of, okay, this is what we do to develop a championship and, and certainly uh, instrumented in Tampa, but then got to, to Indianapolis and Tony adapted and say, oh, well, okay, maybe we do need to change in terms of our mindset because we have a pretty special guy and a pretty special offense here. Coach, I want to talk about uh, dividing powers here. Obviously the success with Baltimore and Baltimore has been a, a, a personnel driven team when it comes to the off season, a coach driven team, when it comes to the season split powers there between the two, mm-hmm. we see a lot of coaches in, you know, they have some success and then they really want to get all the, the power to be able to be in charge of the whole thing. We've seen Belichick do it. Well, we've seen Andy Reid do it. Well, we've seen a lot of other guys fail. I, I'm just curious with you, w- was there ever a point in your career where you thought, man, I would like to go somewhere and have all that power, or did you, you know, what were your thoughts on on dividing that, no, that responsibility? 
because that no one's that smart. Uh, I remember I did a, 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 a lecture at a, a banking group, and they were the whole idea was they came together, and and they were it was a secession plan. Where do we go to replace ourselves and build this secession plan for the bank? And the 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 owner of the bank or the head of the bank was a guy, he must've been 80 years old, very sharp, very clear. He's listened to all that. And he's listening, oh, this, no, it needs to come out of the equities department. No, it comes out of the commercial real estate. Everybody had their little silos and what they thought the next president needed to be. And he got it. He says, guys, wait a minute, hold on. 40 years ago, when I took over this bank, I was the smartest guy in the room, okay? Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist now. We don't need the guy with all the right answers. That doesn't exist. We need the guy with the right questions. And, and so- you see it all the time. Uh, it always amuses me. And it's usually offensive guys. You're an offensive guru. Okay, you're play caller, which is a 24-7, <laughs> right? I mean, you are obsessed with it. You are immersed. In every waking moment, you are focused on design and play calling and the whole thing. And, and it, it can wear you out. Then you get a head job and you go, well, I can do that and be the head coach. I can do all those, you know, I can, I can now where before it was, you know, I, I was sleeping five hours a night and, and totally, but okay, now I can. And, and, but you learn, no, you can't, you, you better learn to del. I always used to call it the 3am rule at 3am. If you wait, and I'm, I'm in an age where I wake up at 3am and <laughs> go to the bathroom and lay home every, every night. What are you thinking about? If you're thinking about, do I put the full back and the flat? Do I run the angle here? Well, then, then that's great. Then you're the coordinator. Who who's waking up at 3 a.m. going, where's where's my next backup center coming from? Who mm -hmm. should we be looking here? What about the cap? Who you, know, you better have someone that you can rely on. Now you can create, you, you know, you can it, it can all clear through you if that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you said it right. I mean, Ozzy Newsom it, it was the perfect partner because he, he listened for one. And as you know, we used to call it scrimmaging, right? We'd come in and yeah. scrimmage. Shaq Harris would come in and would scrimmage. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many times Ozzy and I, and Ozzy always, I knew, I always appreciated the fact that Ozzy understood and appreciated the pressures I was under. And I tried to do the same with him. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times we'd be scrimmaging on a subject and, and I'd be on one side and he'll be on the other. And he'll go, well, let's sleep on it and let's let's reconvene in the morning. We'll come back in the morning. I go, Ozzy, I was thinking, I slept on it. Yeah, I think you're probably right. We need to, coach. I was doing the same thing. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 that ability to have that give and take, and not um, rely on just whose great idea it was, but to take ownership of it. That kind of and and you know you, you can only do that so far. But that kind of give and take, I don't. It, it's the game is too complex. There's too much going on to, for it to be legitimately one stuff. Okay, Belichick and I get it, and that's probably, but that's the only one that I can think of. You look at the other great organizations, there's usually a trifecta, a triumvirate, or at least the bet, you know, the general manager and head coach together. It's a working relationship. I, I don't think there's another organization where you can look at it like in New England and just go, okay, it's it's this is totally it. Can it work with more than two? Because baseball, when I, when I study baseball right now, coach, they have a, a, a leadership teams of like four or five guys and that you can throw the manager as part of that, but really it's kind of a, it's a collection. And, and it started with the Tampa Bay Rays uh, with their general manager who went to the Dodgers and as Andrew Friedman has since built them into a powerhouse and a juggernaut. But he just kind of what you said was like, why should we assume that one or two of us have all the answers? We're going to find if we can find four or five guys that are very bright in their own way and we put our heads together, we can come up with with the right decision. And it's worked in baseball. Could that work in football? Uh, four and five is too many. I mean, you'd love yeah. to have that kind of quality. The yeah. problem you have is when you have in my three is perfect. Two okay. is fine, but three. The reason I say three now you and, and each of them can have lieutenants that are you know, uh, uh, top of the, the charts as well. But the thing I like about three, I keep coming back to, if you have the three right guys, you drive great comfort going, two of the three of us are going to be right. Yeah. Right. There's always that. There's always that. If mm -hmm. all three say something's good, we're good to go. Yeah. But if two of the three like it, you're probably, you know, now if all three don't like it, okay, well then, then you gotta, you gotta reconvene. But, but if two of the three, to me, that's a great counterbalance. I like that. And going for it. Yeah. You, coach, I want to lean into this because um, your experience, I think you'd be uniquely qualified. And this is an extension of that question. Um, and thinking about um, being the head coach and if you could pick your personnel people, like you talked about 
shared visions and those things. How important is it for you guys to see football the same way in terms of what is essential to building a championship team? Or can you have a general manager that may come from maybe a different system, a different viewpoint, but you guys find a way to make it work? I think that goes back to the shared vision in visiting, uh, in listening and, and visiting with different coaches. I think Gary Kubiak was probably as good at this as anybody I've been around in terms of communicating and and it's not just okay this is what I want no I mean it's it's a it's a conversation it's a scrimmage in terms of all right here's the attributes player by player of what I need okay I, you know I, I need I need a, a running back that can do X Y and catch the ball as opposed to run different combinations I always just say we've talked about it for DJ I want a receiving core I want I, I want a basketball team I don't want all power forwards. I want a power forward. I want a big man. I want a point guard. I want an off guard. And each has different attributes. And here's what the attributes I need from this athlete. And, and that needs to be fine. And that's, that's heavy lifting now. you got to spend a lot of time between the coaches and the scouts understanding this is what we're looking for. Your, your offensive line coach needs to be very specific. This is what I'm looking for in a center versus a guard versus a tackle. Now you can negotiate it. You can scrimmage it around a little bit to try to better understand it. But at the end of the day, this is what we see we need for this offense or defense to work. Then it's the jobs of the scouts to go, okay, I've got to go find guys in that position that fits that criteria. Now, Typically, that means coming back and negotiating a little bit because no one's going to fit it perfectly. Guy, Coach, I, I, Bucky, I love this guard. Now, I know you wanted a little more punch from this guy, but I think he makes – so, yeah, you never get – unless, you you know, yeah, he's the first overall pick and he's seven across the boards and, oh, yeah, he's got it all. Well, that's simple. But the negotiation about – because you're, you're negotiating – a little bit with, because nobody has it all. So what am I willing to overlook? Does this offset that to make me, okay, yes. Because otherwise you become so strident in your view of a player, nobody fits. And no, and then you just caught coaches going, well, you can't, you're not bringing me the right players. Well, I'm bringing you what's available. Okay. Well, you got to take somebody. Let's, <laughs> let's negotiate. Let's get as close to it as we can. But we do all have to have the sh- same shared idea of what we're looking for in those particular talents. All right, coach, you've been you've been so generous with your time today. We had a, a million different things we, we were going to go into, but this was just great. I talked too yeah. much. That's a nice. No, way it, we, no, we, no, no, kept, no, no, we no. kept staying on it because no, we're no, keeping great. pages full of notes here on everything we're doing. <laughs> Last thing before we let you go, uh, I remember I was I had to be the Turk one year in Baltimore, mm-hmm. and we'd bring guys to you, and uh, and and you'd have to tell them that that was it. I remember standing outside the office and training camp at the at the Best Western. Right, wasn't that the name of the hotel up there in Westminster? Right, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Mike Solwald was the long snapper, and and you told him that you were going to let him go, and he had said, I could hear him, and he said, this is this is BS, this is not fair, and then you kind of you didn't know what to say on that one, and he said uh, he said you didn't even give me a chance to play quarterback, and then I heard the la- <laughs> the loudest laughter I'd ever heard from you in four years uh, during that time. But is there any other story, Coach, that that I might not be privy to when you had to have oh, those conversations? The best one I used out? to get on you guys because remember now training camp, it's all. You know, that's it's a blur of faces. And when you're cutting a lot of guys, you know, and, and I, <laughs> and, and I is. you know, yeah, because I, you know, he, he's not wearing his jersey. I know yeah. who 46 is, but I don't yeah. know. So they brought me, I forget, uh, it was Jones, I think was the tight end. It break, they bring me a tight end yep. and he sits down in front of me that, and I start going into the routine and I'm looking at him and I'm going, cause you get to reading body language when you do this enough. Yeah. It's a tough thing to do. I've been cut. I always try to remember Tom Landry spent 20 minutes with me when I got oh, cut. Wow. Now, he had better things wow. to do than spend 20 minutes with uh, me. And I thought, you know what, if, if, when I, if I ever get in that position, I, I can, I need to remember the way coach Landry handled it. Cause you are, it's, you know, you're ending a dream. It's like the Clint Eastwood line in unforgiven. You're not only ending what a man has, you're, you're ending what a man ever is going to have, you know, in terms of that dream to, to be a pro player. That was and John guy, Jones, by the way, coach, John Jones. Yes. John Jones. Too. Very good. So he, and, and I'm going through it and he's got a quizzical. I'm thinking this guy is, should know better. This guy should know he's on the ball. He is truly shocked. And then it dawns on me. They brought me the wrong guy. 
<laughs> we're, we're keeping this guy. <laughs> well, now I look like the village idiot because I've yeah. done my whole, oh, geez, it's not my place to say you can't, but it's just, it's my job to say it's not here. And yeah. he's truly, so now I got to, how do I salvage this? So I look at him and I said, <laughs> all right, John, that's what it feels like to be cut. You've made this football team, but I don't ever want to have to have this conversation with you. So get your you and your playbook back in there and keep working. You know, so I sound I pulled it out brilliantly. You know, well, I, I I can say I don't think that one was mine, Coach. But I went into the offensive line uh, room and uh, I had grabbed who I thought was a player, and I had grabbed Damian Cook, if you remember him. By accident. yes, I, I didn't know what he looked like, right? So I grabbed him. So we start walking up the stairs to go upstairs in the old facility. And then I start talking to him, and I realize this is not who oh, I think right. it is. Oh, so I got to take him back into the offensive line room and then say the Pull name the of the guy, guy I have to get. And J.O., Jonathan Ogden, goes, dang, they're cutting everybody. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this guy left. That guy left. Wow. Wow. No, it was not, not, not a good thing, man. Uh, hey, it's, la- you, la- could, you, you could do a series on this. It would be a great comedy sketch because oh. it really is. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing some of, the, uh, some of the conversations you have. And some of the mistakes you make. Last thing I want to say about Coach before we let him go, just to, to remind everybody how great uh, Coach Billick is. Not a, not only as a coach and what he does on television, but how good of a person he is. As we get to Christmas, Buck, I'm, I'm always uh, remember back to a time when I was a poor scout, had no money at all, and Coach came and gave all of us a, a, a check out of his own wallet for a thousand dollars and as scouts at that time that was might have been a million dollars at that yeah. time we went and bought a, our uh, a mac computer uh and i just remember we had that computer forever we always called that computer the brian billet computer because we were uh very thankful for coach, but coach you've that. always been generous in every in every way you've been generous uh, to me over the years and i, I appreciate, I appreciate you. it i gotta i gotta I'm interject because it reminded me of when you guys were talking about the 150 board you always had, you know, yeah, your yeah. 150 players yes. on your board. And you're always shocked at how quickly that thing empties. And we always had, remember, <laughs> we used to have the sideboard. And I told the yeah. scouts, okay, it was like two or three grand. If you pick the, fir- the correctly, the guy, yep. first guy to come off the sideboard. <laughs> Yep, which that energized some things. Now, and guys all have their ba- guys in back pocket, and and that, that got kind of fun. That was always fun to see which guy was coming off that sideboard first. You did first guy off the sideboard. You did one for lowest person on the front board that got picked the highest. So, yeah. in other words, so somebody would be on the bottom of our front board might go in the first round. So we would do that. And so literally the drafts going on, and man, it's it's it moving fun. and shaking like we're doing a 50-50 <laughs> raffle. And so it's funny that you guys are talking about that because I would sit up with. Uh, Shaq and Art Perkins and Ozzy yeah. at the combine, and we would bet on combine performance 40 times. Oh, yeah, over vertical unders. jumps or whatever. Yeah, so, I feel like even though I never worked with the Ravens, I am uh. so impacted and influenced by the Ravens because <laughs> all of those guys were like my mentors. So, it's, it's funny to hear oh, you guys Shaq talk about was the best because I felt like it never ended, everything was a competition. Everything was something about that as Always. related to scouting. You'll remember this. So the, this these moments where you'd be timing forties, and uh, you'd have you'd be in the meeting and you'd be debating a player. Right? I like Jones. He likes Smith. And I'd be like, Well, Smith can't run. Smith's gonna run four six five. <laughs> like, no, no, Smith's gonna run in the low four five. So literally, and at the combine, if you've seen it on television, you know, like there's no talking. You can hear a you can hear a pin drop. But what you'll see if you pay attention and you look at some of the teams, you'll see the clock go like this, and you'll see somebody go. <laughs> and you know you know who got the best of that from the draft meetings those are fun memories well when they started they started televising the draft it got that made things dicey now because now we're everybody i remember we were and and uh i was still coaching and i was sitting i was visiting with uh mike nolan up mm-hmm. in the stands and you know it's it's also kind of a job fair yeah. and a, oh, you yeah. Know, yeah. Just, yeah, there's a lot going on so i'm and, and and all of a sudden i get a buzz on my phone and it's my daughter I go, what's up, honey? He goes, aren't you at the combine looking at? I go, yeah. He goes, then why are you screwing around talking to Mike Nolan? Why aren't you watching? Oh boy, I got busted by my daughter. She's going, quit screwing around, John, with Mike Nolan. Get your eyes back on the field and find us a tight end. You know, oh, that's great. She that's knows. Funny. She knows. She knew. Hey, she knew. Coach, that was, this is so much fun today. Thank you so much for your time. We'll do it again. We appreciate you. Well, Buck, it's great to catch up uh, with Coach Billick. He's he's the best, man. And I, I do encourage everybody to check out the new podcast. I think the trailer uh, might already be up. You can check it out. It's a Total Access podcast with Brian Billick, who you just heard, along with our good buddy uh, Michael Robinson, who's a Super Bowl-winning fullback with the Seattle Seahawks and, and one of the best we have at NFL Media Group. It's a great guy. Uh, looking forward to checking that out. 
Yeah, no, Austin, he's terrific, man. He's so terrific in so many different areas. Um, he is someone that I've leaned on just for regular advice when it comes to like coaching high school ball. But I think this conversation that we just had as it relates to being a head coach, but really working hand in hand with a general manager, I think that's stuff that you don't often have open discussions about, but I think it's very, very necessary. And I will say this, DJ, like, obviously, because I know you've done a lot of homework on the team building stuff. And we look at like team building from a shared vision, but maybe coming from yeah. different angles. The leadership council conversation to me is fascinating. I think Isn't that's that interesting. That, I think that's one that we're going to have to revisit in time because um, for you to do some research on baseball and to kind of go behind the scenes on that, I always look at basketball and how they build teams and talking to guys in that aspect. But then for Coach Billick to to bring out the three. I like the three. I think, I think three is actually the perfect number because it reminds mm -hmm. me of the government and having like a checks and balances system. Three branches. I, three branches. And then when you get to it, if you have to have the straw vote, hey, man, somebody, somebody has to yep. <laughs> so it's somebody. a winner and a loser <laughs> with the decision. Yeah, because no, I think talking, it's great. Yeah, when you, when you talk about four, like you have even numbers. But when you have the odd number, I think, I think, I think it makes it interesting. I don't know how that's developed. I don't know if that's head coach, general manager, and X, but yeah. it is definitely something worth exploring and expanding out. Yeah, I, I, that's something we can dig into. Uh, absolutely. Um, all right. Well, that's going to do it for us today. It was a fun episode. Great to have Coach Billick again. Thank you. Uh, thanks to him for giving us all that time today. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, remember, you can you can leave us some uh, comments and reviews there on Apple Podcasts. We do appreciate those. Um, if you got them, I want to wish, wish everybody a happy holiday season as we are right in the thick of the month of December. The football is good, and uh, the conversation here is good as well. Uh, that's going to do it for us. We'll catch you next time right here on Move the Six, presented by Zaxby's.